They want the Institute of Studies Catalans on behalf of the Catalan Economic Society and an absolute privilege to host the Holbert debate in Catalonia, a country that has the privilege to be the home of Juan who received the prize for his groundbreaking research in ecological economics, political ecology, and environmental justice. Juan, who I know since 1993, this is 30 years ago now, has always been ahead of his time. You are today at the Institute de Studies Catalans, Institute for Catalan Studies, the Catalan Academy of Science and Humanities, an academic, scientific, and cultural institution that covers all disciplines of study. The Institute for Catalan Studies is the Academy of the Catalan Language, and it is a research center of all areas of knowledge. Its influence spans the Catalan-speaking territories, including the Balearic Islands, Northern Catalonia, and Valencia. The Institute for Catalan Studies was founded in 1907 by Prat de la Riva, and since 1922 is member of the International Union of Academies. During the Franco dictatorship, the Institute went into clandestinity until it was recognized again as an academic institution after Franco's death in 1976. 
the Institute of Studies Catalans is divided into five sections and 28 societies, one of which is the Catalan Economic Society, which is the society I'm representing today and has the honor to count with Juan Martinez Alioe among his members. The Catalan Economic Society belongs to the section of philosophy and social sciences. The society, as we know it now, was founded in 1985, but the first president is already from 1950. The main objective of, of the society is to promote research in economics and to contribute to its dissemination. As part of our dissemination activities, we host a blog that aims to be a bridge between researchers and economics and the Catalan society to touch upon the most pressing social issues. This blog, called Sing Centims, published last June the Holbert Prize acceptance speech of Juan. As you can see, the goals of the Catalan Economic Society are perfectly aligned with those of the Holbert debate. This is give voice to the pressing issues on the fields of, in our case, social sciences. Holbert was an outstanding figure of the Enlightenment period, a philosopher, a writer, and an historian. And despite he was a well-traveled intellectual, and as far as I know, he had never been in Catalonia. Nevertheless, his book, Niels Klim's Subterranean Journey, is translated from Latin to Catalan, Al viatge a sota la terra de Niels Klim, by Vicenç Raglà. And we very much hope to see other books translated, such as The Political Thinker or Jeb of the Hill. Klim seeks to find in his travels the ideal society. Today's debate, as well as the life work of Juan Martinez Alie, fight with their intellect to achieve more just societies, to work, therefore, towards an ideal society that can only be found in books. The Environmental Justice Atlas, co-directed by Juan, shows how many anonymous peoples are devoting their lives to defend justice. Without further ado, I would like to welcome you again and express our gratitude to hold the Holbert debate at the Institute for Catalan Studies in Catalonia. Dear colleagues, dear friends, estimats tots y totas. On behalf of the Holbeck Prize, it's a great pleasure for me to see so many of you here at this seminar and at this esteemed institute. My name is Bjorn Enge Bertelsen, and I am the academic director of the Holbeck Prize. I would like to thank the Institut de Studis Catalans for letting us come to this fine location, and it is truly also a beautiful uh, place, I have to say both to host the event today and also to let the Holberg Committee, who is in this room, have its meeting here today. So thank you very much, Ada, as the representative of the Institute. I would also like to thank the excellent speakers who you will hear from shortly. One of them, as also introduced by Ada, is the 2023 Holberg Prize Laureate, Professor Juan Martinez Allier. But before I give the word to him, please allow me a few words in promotion of the Holberg Prize. The portfolio of the Holberg Prize consists of several components. First, the main Holberg Prize is awarded to excellent scholars in the disciplines covered by the prize, which are the humanities, the social sciences, law, and theology. One of the main ambitions of the Holberg Prize is also to inspire young scholars and to promote dialogue across different generations of researchers. The Nils Klim Prize, which Ada spoke about earlier, the historical figure or literary figure of uh, Holberg, is therefore awarded annually to a young researcher from or in a Nordic countries. The prizes are awarded by the Holberg Board on behalf of the University of Bergen and on the recommendation of academic committees, which consist of, in, of outstanding international scholars in the relevant academic fields. The laureates of the prizes for 2024 will be publicly announced on 14 of March this year, and this will also be transmitted online, so you can follow that. However, for the Holberg Prize of next year, we strongly encourage nominations to be submitted through the website of the Holberg Prize until the deadline of 15 June 
2024. And I would like to add that nominations are open to anyone with an academic affili affiliation with a university or a, an academy. In addition to these prizes, we've also established the Holberg Prize School Program, which is an annual research competition for students in the upper secondary schools in Norway. And finally, the Holberg Prize hosts and organizes the Holberg Debate, an annual event inspired by Ludwig Holberg's enlightenment ideas, aiming to explore pressing issues of our time. Please check out, again, our website for further information. But back to today's seminar, and I will shut up. Um, this seminar is uh, directly related to and comes about at the initiative of Joan Martinez Allier. And I now hand the floor to you, Joan, to introduce the speakers and lead us through today's panel. And I will return at the end of the event. Thank you. Well, thank you to Bjorn Bertelsen and to Ada Ferrer for the introduction. And <clears throat> I'm going to introduce now the speakers on this panel, which is uh, the title is Global Political Ecology. So before that, I want to say something about which is the context, in my view, of global political ecology. And as you know, people have been talking about the Anthropocene or writing already for a few years, and I totally agree with the Anthropocene idea, but I want to talk about the Anthropocene with an E. Anthropocene is from Anthropos, and Anthropocene, Anthropocene would be from Entropy. It has always also been used as one other name for the Anthropocene. Entropy because in 1971, Georgescu Regan, an economist, published a book called The Entropy Law, and the economic process. And this book was a foundational book for the whole school of ecological economics to which I belong. In fact, the Holbert Prize was given to me last year because as an ecological economist, political ecologist, and somebody who also writes or tries to help environmental justice. And he thought this was a good definition of what I do. So I am an ecological economist, and I think that the Anthropocene links with this idea. And I want to have a few words on the Anthropocene and the degrowth school, or degrowth in practice, I call it, because the next speaker is going to be Georgios Kalis, who is here, and he's well known in, in this city and in this country and in Europe and in the world as a promoter of the post-growth or the growth school of thinking, belonging to ecological macroeconomics, isn't it? So because of this, I want just to say a few words more about uh, the Anthropocene and the growth in practice. Just two days ago, a group of businessmen there who are promoting a circular economy published a report that they do this every year called the Circularity Gap Report. So the circular is like saying the entropy whole report, because what they show in the, the, of course they take the data not from these business people who are making other things in life, but from academics from the Vienna group of Marina Fischer Kowalski, Hedmul Havel, and so on, who have been doing studies of social metabolism, as Mario Gianpietro here also, in the ICTA UEB, for many years already. What does it mean, the 7% uh, circularity gap report? They mean that for every 100 tons entering in the economy, only 7% seven, only 7 only seven are recycled material. The 93 other amount of materials, which of course are rather like 93 gigatons of materials, more or less, or a bit more now, are fresh materials from what we call the commodity extraction frontiers. We call this in, in uh, world history analysis, of which Z Zera Yassin here in the, in the tribune, she's going to speak, is one very distinguished young member. World history uh, systems from Wallerstein and so on. 
So this is what, uh, in this kind of approach, we know, looking at the whole world economy and looking at things that were not done before 20 years ago, 30 years ago, which is counting the materials in the economy, we know that there is an enormous circularity gap or a metaphoric gap or an entropy hole. All these are synonymous words. And therefore, in my view, this explains or helps to explain all the struggles at the commodity extraction frontiers for coal, for oil, for gas, for bauxite, for lithium now, for copper, for nickel, and also for biomass, because biomass is not recycled in general. It goes to waste also. Another of the speakers here will be uh, Marco Armiero as an environmental historian, and he's going to talk about the humanities, the environmental humanities, which is, uh, you cannot do this in 15 minutes, but you're going to do it in 15 minutes, sorry. And he's a very well-known environmental historian, also based here in Barcelona at the UEB. And he has a book, which some of you must have seen already or heard about, which is called the waste to sin, waste from waste, isn't it? And it's the same thing as saying the entropy, the Anthropocene, I think, because of this art waste. Then the other speaker that we're going to have is Gabriela Merlinski, who is from Buenos Aires. All the speakers here, I looked at it the other day, and we are all from below the parallel 41. I don't remember Bergen, which parallel you are, but you are perhaps <laughs> below the circular polar, art, but, but had much higher, isn't it? Well, the record in being south here has Gabriela Merlinski, who is from Buenos Aires. But we are all the rest, we are from the southern Mediterranean. Marco is from Naples, and George is from Athens. I am from here. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't mean very much, but just to make this point. So I think that uh, Gabriela Merlinski not only is from Buenos Aires, but she's a very well-known political ecologist and uh, sociologist also, first trained in Buenos Aires, but also in, in France, in Paris, she knows well the French traditions in political ecology. And she's a member of something which I think should be promoted more outside Latin America, which is the Latin American School of Political Ecology, which is quite a strong, a very strong as an eco-feminist school also, and of course based a lot on indigenous uh, notions that remain in Latin America even after the conquest. On this, with this, I will finish, and we'll ask a question, which is what we try to answer in the Atlas of Environmental Justice, which is now reaching very soon 4,000 entries. And the question is, who are the antagonists in these conflicts at the, conf at the commodity extraction frontiers and at the waste disposal frontiers also? Who are the antagonists and who are the protagonists? And this is what we have been working on in political ecology. So without any else to say, because we want to do it quickly, and we have like an hour and a half now, or a bit more than this, so I will call Giorgio Scalis to talk, and he announced his talk as a political ecology of economic growth. So I wrote back to him and said, do you mean a political economy? He said, no, no, I mean a political ecology of economic growth. This is something new. It's an article not yet published, I think. So I am sorry you have so few minutes, but you can manage, I'm sure. So thank you very much. Thank you, John. Uh, th thanks, everyone. Thank uh, I thank the, uh, the uh, people of the Holbert Prize for inviting me to be here. Uh, I'm very happy to be here in an event uh, celebrating also the work and research of John. And I have to say that what I have to say is not is not new at all. I think uh, you know in academia we keep reinventing fancy terms to say similar things, and I think it's very marginal improvements. But definitely, it's not new. It's very much based on uh, the work of John, but I want a little bit to make sense of what we have been doing here in Barcelona uh, the last 10 years or so, or even more, those of us working on degrowth. 
And uh, two years ago, um, uh, there was a very nice book uh, edited by members of our team at ICTA um, called The Barcelona School of Political Ecology and Ecological Economics. And there were essays in tribute of Joan that you might want to download. It's, one, it's a huge book that was made open access, and I think we were very proud of that. Uh, and I was charged with writing a, a chapter on degrowth. So I, I gave a little bit more of thought, and I was like, OK, because you know, things happen, and you do things, but you never sit back to reflect on them. And I was thinking a little bit of the, of the story of how did we come to write and talk and think about this concept or this proposal uh, of degrowth, and how did it link uh, to the work of Joanne? And I think as I was doing that, I had kind of did it also in a book that I wrote in 2018 called Degrowth, where I was trying to say, okay, what does degrowth uh, offer to standard economic theories and standard economic reasoning? But while writing this piece, this short chapter about degrowth and and the, the influence of Joanne's uh, line of research on degrowth, I came up with something that you might say is more audacious uh, argument. And the audacious argument would be that what Joanne has been doing and what our group and of course many other people around uh, Europe and the world have been doing working on degrowth is not only proposing a counter, an alternative to the dominant idea of economic gro growth, but also developing piecemeally, but I think in a, in a kind of unified way if one starts synthesizing things, a new understanding of the very process of economic growth. Now, why, why do I say this is audacious? Because if someone is an economist and hears that people that they don't recognize as exactly economists, they are political ecologists, they are environmental scientists, are stepping in to develop a new theory of economic growth that always creates a reaction, right? Uh, but I think this is also the innovation of what John has been brought up that he's an economist, he has been trained as an economic historian, but he was always working interdisciplinary in an interdisciplinary environmental institute with people coming from biology, I came from chemistry, I mean, we came from very different fields, and we were given the space to talk about the economy, which is not very common. Normally, you have to be trained in economics, in an economics department, and talk about economy or economic growth in very particular ways. So which are the ways that we have come to talk about economic growth and in what sense is a new theory or at least a new perspective on the process of economic growth. So the way I, I frame that uh, is in terms of understanding a whole body of knowledge that we might call political ecological economics in the sense that it's political ecology and ecological economics, which I said was the title of uh, the book in tribute of Joanne and of course is uh, it was part of the prize he got from the Holbert Prize. The Holbert Prize he got was for ecological economics and political ecology. So I tried to think of what is it that we bring together when we say political ecology with ecological uh, economics. And there are two concepts uh, in Joanne's work there that I think are central in defining uh, this thing that we might call political ecolo ecological economics. The first concept that Joanne already referred to is the concept of social metabolism. So this is an understanding of the economic process, not as a process of flow of money, of flow of wages, flow of dollar values or euro values of debt and salaries and investments, but understanding the economy as a flow, as a process of energy and materials that enters human economies, it is processed, it is metabolized, and then comes out as waste, comes out as useful services and goods, and a part of it is always irreversibly lost as entropy, which is what Joan just talked about. Uh, this might sound obvious, but of course it's not obvious at all to someone trained in economics, that it's not trained to see the economy in these particular terms. And Joan made the big point of saying that we should start speaking about the economy and measuring it, not just with uh, money, um, figures and GDP figures, but in terms of these other values, which are energy, uh, energy indicators, material indicators, human labor indicators, working time devoted to this metabolic process of processing nature and creating goods, but also waste. And this is a whole new understanding, I think, of the economic process that in a sense is also part of what political ecology has been a lot about. It's about studying this uh, so-called social metabolism. Now, the second important concept uh, that Joanne and his colleagues introduced, um, Martin O'Connor, I believe, was uh, the concept of ecological distribution conflicts. 
So the idea there is that in standard economics, you tend to focus on economic distribution conflicts, which is the conflict between the distribution of wage versus capital. So how much of the total product of a country ends up at the hands of the capitalists versus the hands of the laborers. And the conflict around there are the strikes, the political parties, the communist movements, however you want to think about it, that they are trying to reappropriate part of the surplus and give it to the working class. Joan talked about ecological distribution conflicts and he shifted attention in a metabolic sense uh, to the beginning of the metabolism, which is the extraction of uh, material and energy, and the end, which is the disposal, the waste. And he argued that there are conflicts happening in these parts of the process, and there are conflicts between those who appropriate these resources and those who lose them, or those who pay the costs of pollution. The people that he has studied extensively, who are in the commodity frontiers next to mines, and they lose their land, they lose their water, is polluted, they are dispossessed, they are displaced very often, so that someone else makes profits uh, in another part. And there, there are conflicts. There are people who try to stop that. Uh, and these conflicts, we need to understand them and see them differently than the standard economic distribution conflicts of labor. And I think this is also something that Zechra is contributing, to understand the particularity of this type of conflict and movement and its centrality in contemporary capitalism. Now, throughout the years here in Barcelona, I think we developed this framework and we brought new ideas, especially from Anglo-Saxon political ecology uh, uh, and Latin American political ecology, but I would say also Anglo-Saxon political ecology in the sense that we brought the Marxian school of thought uh, in this model and also a post-structural school of thought into this model. These are big terms, but very simply to explain what I mean. In terms of Marxian thinking, I think what we have incorporated in this model is the importance of surplus, making surplus, and also exploitation. That there are class forces where the dominant classes are exploiting uh, the subaltern or the weaker classes, and they are drawing surplus out of them in this metabolic process. And this surplus can be a surplus of energy, or can be also the surplus of the labor of people, the unpaid work of people. Not only the unpaid work of people who are paid, but also the unpaid work of people uh, who are not paid. Caretakers, mostly women, uh, people, peasants, doing work for nature that it's not paid, etc. So there is surplus and there is exploitation. And post-structural thinking, which is mostly political and sociological theory, you might think of someone like Michel Foucault or this line of thinking that we also have incorporated partly in our work, shows that the conflict is not only a material conflict, but it's also a conflict over ideas. Uh, Joan called that conflict over languages of evaluation. Who has the power to impose on whether a particular piece of land is seen as holy, is seen as an ecosystem, or it's seen as a resource waiting to be exploited and make money? There is a power struggle going on there. And knowledge, the production of knowledge, is both a product of power, who has the power to say that this is a resource and it's not a sacred site or an ecosystem, uh, but at the same time, knowledge is power. So whoever comes there and claims that is a scientist that knows that this is a resource and it's not a sacred site brings a certain power with them. So this type of idea, surplus exploitation and the construction of realities, the construction of concepts like this is natural, this is economic, and this is an ecosystem service, this is the type of things we brought in our work and this is what I would call political ecological economics. Now, what does political economics ecological economics, and that's the last five minutes of my presentation, what does it offer to our understanding of the process of economic growth? And I would say three things, or three theses. First of all, it helps us understand that economic growth is a process of what I would call, like another fancy term to say things that we could say easier, but we can call it metabolic surplus, which is invested to make more surplus. So what I mean by metabolic surplus, I think, I mean, that in the metabolic process there are inputs and then there are people appropriating more of these uh, inputs. So if you think at the beginning of the process there, is, uh, there are sources with energy, that the energy you put to get this energy out gives what we call energy return uh, on energy investment, there is a surplus of energy. When people go to the factory, they work, and they produce more than the work that is needed to reproduce uh, the people themselves, the workers. These are all forms of surplus. 
And when you take this surplus, you concentrate it, and you reinvest it into the means of production, the factories, the technologies, you have what we typically call economic growth. So we have to understand economic growth as a, pro as a process of surplus invested to make more surplus. Part of this surplus is thanks to technological progress, and I think that's what uh, economists like to focus on and talk about, that technological progress brings economic growth, and that's true. Doing things better, doing them faster, doing them more cleverly uh, gives opportunities to draw more surplus out of energy sources, for example. But part of that surplus is also made, in particular, uh, an, an expansive part, and it's difficult to calculate how big it is compared to the other part, but part of this is made through the exploitation of unpaid work, through the exploitation of nature, through the exploitation of paid, uh, paid workers, through the exploitation of care workers. So growth is both a process of exploitation and technological innovation. And I think this understanding of economic growth helps us understand why it's also a very problematic process, which is the critique of degrowth. Because economic growth, to a large extent, depends on the continuous exploitation of uh, human and non-human natures. Now, the second point I would like to make is that this process of economic growth does not just happen. Very often I confront my ideas with libertarians or let's say ultra liberals or I don't know how else they are called people who tell me no economic growth is just people doing business and then the economy grows. That's far from being uh, the case and especially with the tools of political ecology that we have, we know that economic growth is an orchestrated and organized uh, process by a coalition of class interests that they need growth in order to have their profits continue to grow over time. In urban studies literature, this is called growth machines. They have been studied very well in cities uh, in the US, but it's the coalitions of interests, of property developers, um, uh, corporate interests, that they come together in order to make sure that the public administration, uh, to the extent that it controls social surplus, puts it into the growth machines so that it can keep growing and their profits can healthily keep increasing. So there is a growth machine and this is the source also of the conflict. There is also an anti-growth machine which is partly uh, the degrowth in practice movements that Joanne is talking about, which is people trying to confront the growth machine and take some of this surplus back for themselves and for their communities. Now the final and last point is that growth is not only a material process and a power process, but it's also an ideology. So the idea of economic growth as something good uh, is one of the most powerful ideologies of our times. I would say it's as powerful as religion uh, was for pre-secular societies. And what this ideology does, and uh, Timothy Mitchell, uh, you might know him, is a science technology studies scholar and very well known for his work in the Middle East. Uh, he has made the argument that economic growth was the way uh, that the future was brought into the present government. And what he meant by that was that by invoking economic growth, uh, class conflict, current class conflict, the distribution of the current surplus, was displaced by the promise of a better future where there would be more for everyone and no one would have to lose standard win-win argument that we also see nowadays when we talk about climate change and green growth it would be better in the future and no one would have to sacrifice anything. Not the capitalists, not the workers, everyone would be better off. And that's a very powerful idea through which uh, class conflict uh, was managed in the 20th century. It's coming to an end because growth itself is coming to an end, but also because uh, the costs of the exploitation of unpaid nature, uh, human and non-human, is really reaching an, an unbearable limit, and climate change is just one of these manifestations. And there, I think, is where the whole theory and arguments for the growth are coming in. Thank you. I still need you. Yes. I still have uh, Gabriela Merlinski to speak now. Uh, please, I need to put my PowerPoint, if it's possible. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, it's my turn. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very pleased to honor the presence of Joan Martinez Aliera, the influence that he exerts in our thinking. I'm very pleased to be with you. 
And I will turn in turn uh, of political ecology, gender, and decolonization of knowledge. That is something we discuss a lot in, in Latin America. I am part of the group in that in integrates different people of different countries of Latin America, uh, the political ecology, Latin American political ecology of uh, CLACSO, Consejo Latinoamericano de Ciencias Sociales. Uh, and we have a, a very strong discussion about uh, what it means doing political ecology in Latin America, from Latin America. Of course, it is a field in common with Anglo-Saxon literature, as uh, Giorgio came to present. But there is a very strong discussion about the implication of doing field work, doing research, doing uh, social thought uh, in some countries where there is a strong presence of extractivism and violent conflicts between capital, labor, women, etc. So uh, a concept that is very, very used in the literature of political ecology in Latin America, it is concept of territory. We, we only said we do research on the territory, from the territory. We speak also about a, a political ecologies from territory. And it has to be, of course, with a grand involve with the decolonizing uh, project and idea of decolonization about what Hector Alimonda, a, a very important mentor in Latin American political ecology known as a persistent coloniality of the natures in Latin America. And this implies a, 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 a way of doing academy that is very hybrid, we say unfit practice, because it's very focused on social grass, grassroots and environmental conflict. This idea, this strong idea of Joan about a conflict of ecological distribution and very uh, settled in the discussion of the assemblies, assemblies about people fighting against uh, the pesticides, mining, etc. And there is another discussion that is very important, is about imaginaries, uh, something that Giorgio has said, no? Uh, grow is an ideology, so it, perhaps we need to fight with this, with new imaginaries. And it's for that that another colleague, very, very strong thought uh, of uh, Latin America, Arturo Escorobar, insists a lot about uh, doing research, doing academy with the movements and putting a new discussion about knowledge of politics of knowledge that is about uh, different ways that especially in the 21st century become from the movements about the uh, feminist ethic, environmental movements in defense against extractivism and this idea of, uh, is, uh, is from Arturo Escobar, of collective embodied concepts. That means people doing uh, or participate in different campaigns, being part of the conflicts, has also their own terminologies. That is another idea that has been uh, very developed by Joan, that is, is the uh, valoration of language. No? This, uh, in the process of being in a conflict, people always develop new ideas of what is counts, what is in the center of the struggle, what it means in local language values. No? Uh, Joan always says, even they know the value money, it is another value that is involved in the conflicts. And in the last 20 years, and perhaps more, but it has a lot of presence, is the presence of feminist, eco-feminist. And it's for that we start to speak in, a, in, a, in, in different audience in this field of uh, Latin American political ecology about uh, feminist political ecology coming from Latin America. And there is a very strong focus on these two terms, uh, Giallo Herrera from here use a lot when he speak about uh, when she speak about ecofeminism that is interdependence and ecodependence. Uh, usually, when you have this uh, extractivist advance, uh, you have women in the front of the fights, and women say that they're very, very, very affected by extractivism, not only because of the thing we know, uh, love grabbing. The, 
uh, appropriation of nature, the appropriation of water, but also because there is something about the local economy and the housewives that changes a lot. So they say that extractivism is something that affects very central to the gender relationships. So we have a lot of new experiences in the last uh, 20 days. Perhaps there are this new vocabulary we can to take for make a big or wider conversation. Uh, the first thing is environmental defenders and community feminists, that is indigenous, peasant, uh, women in the city that are defending the river, defending the commons, defending the seeds, and they are very, very criminalized, no? There are, Murders, no? We know very well that Berta Cáceres in Honduras, Betty Cariño in Mexico. There are women that are in the front line of the defenders and that are uh, assaulted, that are victim, victimized, that are, they have problems, very strong problems. And it is for that there is a strong connection between the fighting against extractivism and the fighting against violence and gender violence. So for that, there are uh, these communists, this, pardon, this, sorry, this community feminists that especially are feminists from the territories, from indigenous community, that this is a lot that there is a new struggle to, you need to pay more attention about gender, about race, about ethnicity, and about class. We, there is a, a very strong interpolation to the classic feminists, the white feminists. And, also, there is a very strong discussion about the colonial feminist that is about uh, the discussion of what it means esclavage in Latin America and Afro-American woman in this, um, in this uh, conflicts. And also, there is new uh, eco-feminist and um, eco-feminist, eco um, how do you say? Uh, yes, eco feminist uh, imaginaries about uh, discussing land, territory, environmental justice, injustice in terms of genders. And also, there is a very strong uh, term uh, regarding gender and failed climate solution. People from the South say that sometimes there is a rhetoric uh, discourse about climate change that also propose the same solution for these uh, different regions. And sometimes the uh, low carbon transition has uh, new ways of land grabbing, of changing the use of water on land on the territory. And to show you the different ways that this politic of knowledge works, I have a lot of uh, materials here that are not exactly academic productions that go to the index system, but they are very important in terms of public debate in Latin America. Uh, for instance, on the right, La Vida en el Centro y el Crudo Bajo Tierra is a production of uh, the collective Yasuní in Ecuador, that is a very strong discussion about leaving the oil in the soil, but this is a production of uh, the collective there is Yasunidos, because people also take the name of the fighting in terms of the identities, but in this case there is Yasunidos, but also Yasunidas, that is the gender, the woman, people in this, in this type of discussion. In the center is this glossary of climatic justice, um, it's very used, this idea of the vocabulary of environmental justice, people putting new concepts, discussing the other concept. In this book, you have the discussion about uh, the ecological modernization of climate change, a new uh, discussion, for instance, about the concept of global south, what you always concentrate on that and not on the north uh, of, the, of the planetary scale of analysis. Cuerpos, territorios y feminismos, that is very important because it's a, a, a point of view of putting the continuity between bodies and territories in the feminist fights. Uh, and there is a concept very important, I will show you, that is uh, our territory, our body. This is a manglar in Central America. And this is very important in feminist terms because uh, our territory, our body, means also that 
a discussion about the hierarchical femi uh, binarism, not only capital and labor, but also public and private production, consum consumption, uh, personal, political, etc. And this is uh, an another idea about deep picture, I, it's very difficult to pronounce for me, relational notion that, that this possession is something that happened not only in terms of class, of ethnicity, but only in terms of gender. No? Uh, to, to go to the end, I think it's interesting to have a discussion. Perhaps we have a few minutes with the audience to have a discussion about how this uh, type of uh, knowledge, of politics of knowledge, challenge uh, these universal clients about that subord subordinate other forms of knowledge. What we say when we speak about political ecology or global political ecology about this local concept. Can we say that there are local concepts or there are decolonized concepts? That for me, it's a very important discussion. Second, there are a lot of questions about the commons in this uh, practice I have been describing. Because commons are the seeds, commons are the water, but commons also are the practice, the practice to put in common. And in the feminist, there is, is very important because there is a very intersectionality between the fightings of different moments of the social reproduction. No? For instance, in Argentina, we have a strong moment two years ago about the question about the fighting for the abortion, the, the abortion law, and connected with this other practice about our body, our territory. The body became something that connects this experience. First, there are intersection articulations that happens not only in the concept, but also in the practice but we have a very wide movement of feminists and eco-feminists in all over Latin America. If we do this activity in Buenos Aires, uh, Brazil, Mexico, etc., we will have people for the audience from this movement because it's how we do the activities on the field of uh, political ecology. And this intersectional art articulation are important in terms of uh, to the, the final question I put in, in the PowerPoint, that is the... Uh, I can see it. We signifying <laughs> gender positionalities because we need to talk more. You, Joan, speak in the beginning about antagonism and protagonism. I love it. Uh, yes. Uh, we know women are part of antagonism and there is something that rests to discuss there, but sometimes uh, women are not protagonists as we need to be. So perhaps uh, this is a good point for starting in this discussion. Thank you very much. Now we shall have Sera Yassin, who has just arrived in Barcelona. And she's going to be here for some time. I mean, I didn't say this because she's finishing a book on, on what happened in West Asia. Uh, after the fall of the Ottoman Empire in 1919, and how more or less, to, to simplify, British petroleum took over politically and, <laughs> and materially. And so it's about the geopolitics and the politics of the oil industry and its book that has been written in the last few years and that we hope will be finished while you are here and published. Uh, thank you so much, John, and uh, thank you so much, Holberg Prize uh, Committee, to, uh, for inviting me here. I, I'm really excited to be part of this meeting, actually. Um, and um, as John said, I, in this presentation, I will bring a world systems or a world historical perspective to some of the central concerns of the global political ecology, and I will try to do that uh, by covering and integrating some of the central uh, aspects of my work in a, in a more compact way, hopefully. And my purpose here is uh, to locate uh, the global spread um, of local and transnational environmental justice movements in a broader socio-historical context of political economic processes forming and reforming the capitalist world economy. Uh, as Enrique Lev argues, in the present conjuncture of the 21st century, history is pr um, mobilized primarily 
not by the conflicts in the field of political economy, such as class conflicts, class movements, or the labor movement, but by the socio-environmental conflicts in the field of political ecology. Uh, so this point constitutes a central departure point for this presentation. I argue that we can understand the world historical sources of the political ecological mobilization by understanding the historical nature of the socio-ecological contradiction of the capitalist world economy. The question is how large-scale political economic processes of capitalist development has, have transformed our nature and our relation to nature in historically and geographically distinctive ways, generating socio-environmental conflicts, a theme actually that everybody in a way underlined. And I suggest bringing and integrating a socio-ecological approach to global political economy and a world historical approach to uh, political ecology. Uh, what do I mean by the um, socio-ecological contradiction of uh, the capitalist world economy? Actually, it was James O'Connor who firstly introduced the idea of second contradiction of capitalism as a crisis theory. In contrast to the classical Marxist uh, theory of crisis as a demand side crisis of underconsumption, O'Connor's theory of crisis as a supply side crisis of underproduction indicates how the externalizations of, externalization of the costs of production uh, on the conditions of production, which includes nature as well, reduces the productivity of these conditions themselves and raises the, um, uh, the, 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 the increases contradictorily the cost of production. Uh, although this approach externalizes uh, the ecological crisis dynamic of capital's accumulation through the concept of conditions of production, nevertheless, it addresses uh, the, the, the relations of uh, social reproduction at the global level. I argue that we need to develop an understanding of the second contradiction as an internal, not external, but internal aspect of socio uh, internal socio-ecological aspect of capitalist relations of accumulation. And there are already eco-critics with an eco-Marxism that aims to internalize nature in explaining ecological contradictions of capitalism. However, at the conceptual level, these perspectives operate within the analytical framework of capital-labor relation underlying Marx's value theory of labor in which wage labor has been uh, seen as the only source of value formation uh, based on exploitation. And uh, among this perspective, one perspective uh, centralizes undervaluation or appropriation problem in which nature is conceived as an external force of production uh, as use value or resource uh, that is appropriated by capital as an ex um, uh, to increase the productivity of labor or the rate of profit. And another, the second perspective, centralizes the concept of the metabolic rift, conceiving the uh, wage labor formation or proletarianization as the source of human nature separation or alienation. And in the former, the, in the first one, the ecological crisis become a quantitative and material crisis of capitalism and of planet uh, through the depletion of natural resources. And in the, in the second one, it becomes a more qualitative crisis uh, uh, of separation or alienation through the commodification of labor with some quantitative outcomes. As Mindy Schneider and Philip McMichael argues, this analytical framework privileges labor rationality and underrepresents nature in the, in the dialectic relationship between society and nature. In a way, in the theory, nature becomes an external trans-historical uh, element of the theory. And so thereby, these approaches are limited for exploring how the processes of nature, uh, appropriation of nature or extraction of nature leads to socially, geographically, and politically broader transformations shaping and reconfiguring human nature interactions. And I will try to show the importance of this point uh, the, the, through the uh, historical example that John underlined uh, uh, um, on, on, the, on one of the extractive frontiers of the Middle East. So drawing particularly uh, on the uh, historical archives of British Petroleum Company uh, and the subsidiary companies of the biggest uh, oil companies of the time in the uh, early 20th century, um, especially operated in Mosul and the Iraqi area, I conducted historical research uh, of the, on the formation of um, West Asian or Middle Eastern oil frontiers 
with a focus, with a particular focus on northern Iraq region, which is uh, numbered as four, um, in northern Iraq. Uh, and this research shows, and I uh, expect to uh, be this, this research to be uh, uh, coming out as a book. Uh, this research shows that we need to understand the relationship between capitalist development and nature from a relational and socio-historical focus on socio-ecological interactions and their transformation underlying the social relations of production and reproduction. And in the instance of Musul, we see how um, the formation of a crude oil extraction frontier in the first half of the 20th century did not only mean the construction uh, of a special economy of the oil industry as a material process of appropriation of nature, but it also involved a dissolution of the existing regional agro-pastoral economy and socio-ecological relations or metabolism that was based on a circulation mode of affiliation with nature that is based on human mobilization across geography in the, in the greater border regional area. Um, and with its some nomadic and semi-nomadic elements. And this circular, a circular mode of affiliation with nature reproduced, could, could have reproduced itself by the, by the early uh, 20th century uh, thanks to the, uh, in the, or in the geopolitical context of the Ottoman uh, imperial uh, borders which um, gave this mobilization uh, some permeability as opposed to the distinct impermeability of the national borders. Um, and in that sense, the formation of Musul oil frontier entailed firstly a remapping of the Ottoman vilayet of M Musul within the boundaries of the emerging geobody of the nation state of Iraq after the First World War. So here, we, the, these uh, red lines shows uh, the, the new boundaries between Turkey and Iraq that incorporates Musul within the uh, within nation state of Iraq, which is emerging at the same time, simultaneously at, at the same time, uh, in, uh, in the process uh, with the process of uh, commodity extraction uh, frontier formation, and the post-imperial, post, uh, and post-colonial nation state formation in the region constituted a geopolitical process of producing an extractive frontier of capital accumulation based on fossil, fossil fuels within the first historical context of the crisis of British hegemony and the rise of um, US hegemony. The, the Mosul instance unveils how nation state rule indicated a new order of governance of geography, ecology, and socio-ecological interactions predicated on formally defined boundaries within the context of the open door policy that underlined the new capitalist logic of accumulation uh, of the US-centered world economy. And the, 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 the boundaries that I showed uh, uh, in the previous slides became also the, the um, economic boundaries of the new concessionary area, the, the, the extractive region zone of uh, Musul region at the same time based on the concession agreements between the companies and the Iraqi nation state. So this new order ensured a secure, stable, and rational calculable access, uh, to, to put in Max Weber terms, for capital uh, to nature and oil through a concession regime. And uh, this concession regime involved and was based on the control of the whole geography, as in this case, uh, and um, uh, th this geography was reproduced as a site of the oil concession uh, um, uh, by uh, being basis for the material and special construction of an entire industry as a geographically disper dispersed yet connected flow system of the cycle of extraction in the oil fields, uh, the oil processing in the industrial plants, and flow of oil through transport, uh, pipeline transports, in which uh, uh, continued until the Mediterranean Sea. So this is another diagrammatic layout of the company uh, uh, in, the, in the region. So that, uh, that it shows the integration of the uh, or re reorientation of the cities in the region, uh, not integrated with their, uh, in a way, not integrated with their agro-pastoral hinterland, but the, the need arising uh, industrial plants of uh, uh, crude oil extraction. Um, uh, 
So in this way, uh, that, that materiality, that special economy of oil enables the secure flow of oil, uh, secure flow of oil to Europe. Uh, and uh, so the nation state rule and oil concessions signified uh, sim simultaneously existing a national regulated value regime and a socio-metabolic regime that prefigured a new ontology of life, of human nature interaction and of territory and land. The emerging social ecology of oil signified the abstraction of nature from the existing forms of agro-pastoral socio-ecological relations of production and reproduction, and it is transformation into a commodified resource. This new ontology in turn reproduced the region as one of the major oil suppliers of the world economy by the mid 20th century. The Mosul instance is one geographically distinct historical example of the global expansion of commodity extraction frontiers through which uh, to do specific political, economic, geopolitical, and socio-ecological reconfigurations. In these frontiers, nature gains a world historical abstract sociality through the commodity form and turns into a source of value. So the question is, how we can conceptually recognize this historically specific abstract sociality of nature? Can we see capital nature relation by itself uh, in addition to capital labor relation uh, by itself as an internal dynamic of capital accumulation? Here, Stephen Bunker's distinction between extraction and production based on different logics of accumulation is critical. He argues that in extractive processes, the, the role of labor and nature reverses. While the production of use value occurs within nature itself, the labor becomes an external force of appropriating it and not the source of value formation itself. To advance Bunker's arguments further, by going beyond the labor rationality, in explaining the political economic processes and integrating what Enrique Lev expresses as environmental rationality in the, in the theory, I have offered a value theory of nature. Through this theoretical reconstruction, I argue that the creation of value in extractive frontiers are based on the transformation of organic and inorganic nature into concrete nature, into an abstract or objectified nature through the commodity form. The emerging capital nature relation as a value relation dominates and reconfigures human nature interaction and socio-ecological metabolism by uh, by reducing nature or diverse ecosystems into a fixated economic uh, source of value. Uh, so this theoretical intervention can resolve what Lev sees as the problem of the recognition of nature's qualitative material and uh, non-quantitative uh, material and qualitative non-material values and can account for the incorporation of natural processes in the general conditions of production. But now from a new position, a new political position that centralized the principles of ecocultural productivity, ecological resiliency, territorial rights, and environmental justice, as Lev uh, uh, puts it. So far, uh, so far, the history of capitalist development has been written through the analytical lens of the first or social contradiction of capitalism that can be expressed as the class contradiction between capital and labor. A historical exploration of capitalist development from the lens of capital nature relation um, can unveil the second contradiction of capitalist production, but now as an internal contradiction, which I conceive as, a, as the socio-ecological contradiction between capital and nature. This also implies rethink the, category, rethinking the category of class based in environmental rationality and not only in labor rationality. And how the second contradiction, how the socio-ecological contradiction creates new class dynamic, new forms of class conflict and class politics. Um, so this perspective uh, links global political economy to global political ecology and is comprehending and is critical for comprehending John's uh, argument that environmental conflicts are not only uh, the conflicts of the distribution uh, of environmental benefits and costs, but also the valuation of nature. It enables situating the global environmental justice movement that uh, John conceptually views and empirically demonstrates as the socio-ecological contradiction in action. The world system scholars, such as Immanuel Wallerstein, Terence Hopkins, Giovanni Arrighi, in late 1980s conceived 
the transformation of the purse or the social contradiction uh, in action uh, that manifests through, through the labor or working class movements during the uh, 19th and 20th centuries as anti-systemic movements that develop against the historical capitalism or the world system of historical capitalism. So based in a new analytical lens of capital nature relation, we can argue for the environmentalization of the anti-systemic movements confronting the, the, the socio-ecological con contradiction of, uh, or socio-ecological relations of capitalist expansion. Um, and in that sense, I conceive global environmental justice movement as, as a socio-ecological contradiction in action as, as an anti-systemic movement. Uh, the socio-ecological contradiction of capitalism has created an expanded, expanding global socio-ecological question, especially appearance since the late 20th century, which we have experienced in, the, in different multiple uh, phases, such as the agro-environmental question, urban environmental question, the food mal malnutrition crisis, the climate crisis, and so on. The capital nature lens, um, Uh, the, the, the capital nature lens recognizes the socio-ecological class dynamics of these distinct but world historically related uh, 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 questions. The agro-environmental question, to give an example, already indicates the conflict between capital that creates a bioeconomic agrarian frontier of nature in the form of flexible crop plantations on one side and the, the rural communities, including peasants, smallholders, indigenous people, uh, pastoralists on the other side, who not only depend on nature for their social reproduction, but also who also contribute to, to, to the reproduction cycles of nature. So I argue that this second class dynamic constitutes the, the, the world historical uh, common ground for the globally separate uh, place-specific socio-environmental conflicts manifesting into the global environmental justice movement. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Now, Marco Armiero. Yes, thank you. If the PowerPoint could be on, please. But yes, I, I, thank you. So first of all, uh, many thanks to the Olber Prize, the Institute for Environmental Science and Technology, and in particular, Professor John Martinez Salier for providing me with this opportunity to discuss together today with you the connections between political ecology and environmental humanities. I, I will also try today to convince you, hopefully I will be successful, uh, about the relevance of environmental humanities in understanding the current social ecological crisis. Once, the literary critic, radical intellectual, and writer Raymond Williams wrote that we need new ideas because we need new relationships. This simple epigraphic statement addresses one of the most vexed questions in social theory, the friction between the materiality of socio-ecological conditions and the agency, or at least the relevance, of narratives and imaginaries. Raymond Williams' intellectual biography should dispel any accusations of post-materialism. Williams was an influential Marxist scholar who was also socially engaged. Speaking of narratives and their power, and other colleagues today have done this, Gabriella, Georgos, right, Joan himself, um, speaking of narratives and their power does not imply underestimating the power of socio-ecological structures. Marxist geographer David, David Harvey once said that there is nothing unnatural about New York City. Let me provoke you today by adding that similarly there is nothing immaterial about narratives and imaginaries. Hollywood and Netflix should know this quite well, judging from the profits they are making by shaping our collective storytelling. Often, the, often we imagine a sort of division of labor. Some work on social metabolism, maybe Joanne, while others uh, focus on narratives, stories, and imaginaries. If we are unlucky, and many times in academia we do are, 
unlucky. If we are unlucky, the division of labor becomes a hierarchy of relevance with opposing fan bases supporting the primacy of one over the other. As you might have guessed today, I will offer a different reading of this relationship. In, my, in all my theoretical and empirical work, I have argued that narratives and social metabolism should be understood together, overcoming a dichotomous vision separating the two. In other words, I agree with the environmental historian Richard White that we live in an hybrid world where the sharp separation between environmental, social, and cultural has become blurry. Empires taste like coffee, or maybe oil, <laughs> uh, but it's difficult to taste, maybe. Empires taste like coffee, dams are political manifestos, and stock markets flow into human bodies as cancer cells. I will employ a few examples from my research portfolio in a moment. Now let me spend a few minutes presenting the new field of environmental humanities and its connection to political ecology. But I need to do a small experiment, still in the 15 minutes, I'm sure. So I want to ask you, how many of you have ever heard of the environmental humanities? You can raise your hand. No, my students doesn't count. I see you. No, you, you, no, no, it's not. Don't do that. I can see you, Sergio, on the back. Okay. okay. Uh, but thank you. And well, I, maybe I can ask another question. In your university, how many of your universities offering a course, a master degree, maybe a research center in environmental humanities? One. Okay. So maybe I need to spend a few moments on this. Um, uh, this, this map might explain a little bit also what is happening. Now you can see there is a concentration of environmental humanities, especially in European north, a little bit in the center, maybe not so strong the presence in the rest of Europe. Similarly to political ecology, environmental humanities is not a new discipline, but rather a field of studies where diverse disciplinary practices meet. Perhaps at the very foundation of environmental humanities lies eco-criticism, that is the study of literature from an ecological point of view, but soon other disciplines join the ensemble, such as environmental history, religious studies, film studies, and many others. You have here another map, much worse than the other one. I made it, the other one was made by a student of mine, you see the, the gap here. <laughs> as an intellectual project, the environmental humanities builds on the assumption that we can only understand and address the socio-ecological crisis uh, if we explore human cultures, histories, and beliefs. Even deeper than that, we cannot understand the socio-ecological crisis if we do not see how much those things I have just mentioned are embedded into the materiality of our social metabolism. Environmental humanities helps to decipher the hidden infrastructure of meaning that organizes our social metabolism and even the alternatives to it. Environmental humanities and political ecology share many things. It is telling that in an influential article, Libby Robin and colleagues pointed to environmental justice as the ideal common ground around which the two multidisciplinary fields could coagulate. To confirm this kinship between environmental humanities and political ecology, consider one of the classics in environmental humanities. Since its very title, Rob Nixon's Slow Violence and the Environmentalism of the Poor is in direct continuity with Professor John Martinez Salier's work. In this slide, you can see a little bit the divergences between environmental humanities and political ecology, at least my understanding of them. In particular, I would like to focus on power as a crucial issue in the tension between political ecology and environmental humanities. I'm convinced that environmental humanities needs close interaction with political ecology to avoid the risk of depoliticization, which I do see in some trends within the, that field. For instance, a few years ago, in an environmental humanities workshop, someone accused me of having a naive and quite primitive understanding of toxicity. The argument was that everything and everyone is toxic, and purity is a racist illusion. But, while I do agree that purity might not exist, toxicity does, and it affects people and communities in unequal ways. 
the risk of a very abstract and perhaps theoretically sophisticated understanding of toxicity is the dismissal of decades of struggles for environmental justice. I can add that the colleagues criticizing me for my naive interpretation of toxicity were not willing to spend a sabbatical year with their families in flammable, a shanty town in Buenos Aires, or in the land of fires, a highly polluted area around Naples, Italy. Perhaps, when you have to experience toxicity firsthand, things might seem less sophisticated than when you are writing about them on a safe distance. As I promised, I will spend the rest of my talk presenting a few examples of environmental humanities informed by political ecology from my own intellectual work. In 2021, as John kindly mentioned, I introduced the concept of the waste of sin as part of the ongoing debate on the limits of the mainstream narrative of the Anthropocene. This narrative depicts, the Anthropocene narrative depicts human species as a geological force overlooking or downplaying differences in terms of class, gender, race, and history. The Westocene is int integral to the intellectual mobilization aiming to unveil what the Anthropocene narrative hides. Speaking of the Westocene refers to something very extremely material, the accumulation of waste, particularly toxicity, within the fabric of life, what I call the organosphere. However, the waste of sin is not only about material waste visible everywhere. It's the age of wasting relationships producing wasted people and wasted ecosystems. Here, we shift from the thing, waste, to the socio-ecological relationships, wasting, equally material, producing profits for a few through extraction and ordering. In my theorization of the waste of sin, I included the concept of toxic narratives. The wasting relationships of the waste of sin are concealed by a toxic narrative infrastructure that invisibilizes, normalizes, and naturalizes injustices. I speak of a toxic narrative infrastructure because like all infrastructure, we use it without even thinking, realizing that it shapes our understanding of reality and even our possibilities to act upon it. An historical case will help me to explain better what I mean by toxic narratives. This is my recently published volume on the Vaillant Dam disaster, now available in Italian, but MIT Press has already acquired the right to publish it in English. 60 years ago, in 1963, a gigantic landslide fell into a reservoir up in the Venetian Alps, generating a sort of tsunami that overcame the dam, destroying everything in the valley, 2,000 people were killed. Why can this story from the 1960s help us understand what I have discussed so far, that is the materiality of narratives, the relevance of toxic narratives, and the need for an alliance between environmental humanities and political ecology. Dams are narratives about modernization and progress written into the landscape. The rhetoric of the greater common good, I, I am now quoting the Indian writer and intellectual Arundhati Roy, the uh, re rhetoric of the greater common good is written by words and reinforced cement. And it becomes real through the expropriation of lands and common resources. Opposing to the construction of a dam implies a series of assumptions. It means not being modern enough, being ignorant, and at the very essence, being afraid of progress. After the disaster in 1963, the main newspapers and even the political party in power at that time, the Christian Democrats, uh, proposed a toxic narrative that first naturalized and then invisibilized the event. In the aftermath of the slaughter, they argued that it was a natural and unpredictable disaster. No one was responsible, right? Over time, the Bayonne disaster was progressively erased from the collective memory of the country. It did not fit well with the story of progress and modernization representing the trajectory of Italy after World War II. And here, I think I am connecting pretty well with what Giorgio said about the power of an ideology, no? And I'm now closing my talk. What is immaterial? about this kind of narrative. Can we understand the implications of a dam without understanding the implications of the narratives allowing the death of 2,000 people? In other words, prioritizing the profit of a few 
over the defense of the lives of many. The story of the Bayonne Dam disaster is only an example of how crucial the alliance between environmental humanities and political ecology is. In my book on the Bayonne, I write, and I'm quoting from myself, for those, I think it's called <laughs> self-plagiarism, but <laughs> you are not going to grade me, so it's fine. No, maybe you are. For those who envision environmental history as a neutral field of study dedicated solely to nature and therefore free from the partisan division of society, a history like that of the Bayonne serves as a reminder that ecology is always political, perhaps even more, even more so when its stories are naturalized as if the deaths of 2,000 people were merely the tragic epilogue of a prehistoric landslide." End quote. This is why we need a political ecology attentive to the narratives and an environmental humanities that does not shy away from power. Science fiction writer Ursula Le Guin once said that we live in a crisis of imagination. Someone has called it capitalist realism, referring to the impossibility of imagining other worlds. Our task is nothing less than to understand the social metabolism and the narrative infrastructure of which our world is made, while uncovering the rhizomatic stories, proving that other socio-ecological relationships are not only needed, but already here because, paraphrasing Raymond Williams, I argue that we need new narratives because we need new relationships. Thank you. Now in the program, uh, we said that we're going to have questions and then we're going to have a summary and Jorn is going to help us. And uh, I want to say about Marco Armier, I was going to, I didn't know whether he was going to mention this, but he was recently interviewed, and at the end, as happens to me, some of us at least, the interviewer uh, woman asked him, are you an optimist towards the future? When I am asked this question, I say I have not only some daughters and, and son, and I have granddaughters, one in the audience. So I am a professional optimist because you cannot be an, op not be an optimist if you already have grandchildren. You have to give a good memory to them. But this is my answer. But his answer was very different. He said, optimist about the future? He said, I am very optimist about the past. <laughs> because, because as a historian, we're finding all kinds of interesting stories. Well, this is how I interpreted your answer. Because so many stories are coming up about the past, how reinterpretations, no progress, but no. There's a new book called The Sewers, no? The Sewerage, The Cloacas, The Sewerage of Progress on the Salto River in Mexico near Guadalajara. It just came out by Cindy McCulloch. So we look at the past and we say, well, progress is not so progressive, the progress. And of course, in Latin America, they have known this from history and in West Asia. All the things we talk about are about perhaps this, how to reinterpret. Environmental history is very good for looking at history in a different way, combined with the economy, with the sociology, with the politics. And I think, I don't know, Holbert was too young for these things. <laughs> <laughs> but he would have liked it, I think. We are missing a bit the theology in our talks, I think. But next time we can have help. Because Holbert was not only a philologist of the Norwegian, Danish language. So it's very appropriate to have this here in this building and in this institute. But also he was a lawyer, isn't it? A rector of the university in Copenhagen. So I learned all this after I got the prize. I didn't know so much. Although I have seen many times the statue of Holberg in Copenhagen near the Environmental European Environment Agency in front of the opera in Copenhagen because I was visiting quite often the European Environment Agency and I thought, who was this person? Isn't it? And because of the prize, now I'm more familiar with the history of Norway, Denmark, and, and also of the humanities there. And as Ada said very well, there are always some local connections like this translation of the book Nils Klimt, isn't it, into Catalan, from Latin. 
So we are cannot, it's difficult to be at the level of somebody like this. So apart from being again grateful, again and again grateful for the Holbert Prize last year, now we should have, I think, a debate among the, ourselves, or perhaps you can help us to, to do it. Yes. Now, first, I would just like to thank the the panelists for four excellent uh, papers. I think they've started us up very, very well, uh, and they all, in important ways, I think, uh, reflect your work, uh, Joan. Some, you know, make reference it make reference to it more directly and some more indirectly. But I think there is a coherence here and a, a clear reflection of your importance as well. I think we should start perhaps by opening up to a few questions from the audience because that's very often relegated to the very end and there is almost never any time at the end for the audience to speak so I think we should open up. I have things to say and I'm sure you have as well but let's open up the floor. So raise your hand and uh, my colleague will be over with a microphone so please stand up and say your name. Yes, St say your name and um, and who the, who the question is directed to. Thanks. Hi, Leticia from ICTA. Uh, this question is for Jorgos Kalis. And um, it is about what, how do you see the role of this information in terms of uh, biased, ill-intended information or the active production of ignorance in sustaining this powerful narrative around economic growth? Yeah, maybe, maybe Marco can can respond to that better because I think um, it fits much better to what he asked. He he presented about narratives, and so I don't have to say something very advanced there. But I would say it is true that there is misinformation. It is true that there is, especially around climate uh, climate change. You know, we know that there is uh, willful misinformation, and part of what I call the growth machine is. Uh, intentionally trying to create uncertainty. Manufacturer uncertainty is another thing that we know exists in environmental conflict. Uh, but I think what I wanted to emphasize, and perhaps is also what Marco wanted to emphasize, is also the, the ways beyond, the, beyond intentional misinformation through which our mental infrastructures are creating certain realities that then become very powerful. And I think with economic growth, it's not so much the willful lying about economic growth. It's like how it has become a, a structuring ideology of our times, uh, embodied by all of us, and then reproduced, which I think is a much more difficult thing to change than simply saying, well, they are lying about the effect of economic growth on climate change. On, carbon emissions. It, it is much more difficult because it is a way we see reality. So now we all see as, as a real thing that there is a national economy out there, that it is a, it is a thing and that ne this thing needs to grow, otherwise it's unstable. So we all talk in these terms. We all see ourselves as part of this term. We position ourselves as workers, consumers. Now this is like a huge ideological construction um, and it's part of the problem now. I don't know if Marco wants to add something. I think that what is really challenging is precisely when a toxic narrative becomes an infrastructure. Because, you know, when there is uh, somebody manufacturing, uh, you know, doubts uh, on the payroll of a big fossil company, you know, it, I, don't, I don't want to say it's easy because it's never it's easy, but at least you have some more tools. But I completely agree. The problem with the toxic narrative that it's so strong and it becomes an infrastructure even to think about what is happening. And this is what I meant that this infrastructure is also uh, giving us the possibility for alternatives, that the alternatives are inside the same toxic uh, narrative, right? And I should also maybe mention that the idea of a toxic narrative is not me, it's not by me, it's actually it was an idea um, um, put forward by a collective of Italian writer, uh, writers, I mean novelists, booming, maybe you know them because they are very well known also abroad. And I want to acknowledge that sometimes knowledge is not only coming from, you know, our university, but also from abroad, like a collective of uh, writers. Sarah and Gabriel, 
Uh, would you like to comment on this question as well, or? I can I add only a title because it will be long, but perhaps this is something we need to discuss more about um, ecological economy, because if not about only distribution, it's only about participation, recognition, and how to alter the balance of power. So perhaps sometimes it's not the the, uh, there is the intentional production of ignorance, but sometimes there are an, another uh, way of thinking things, but they don't have space. And they don't have space because institutional mechanisms don't allow them. So it's about recognition. Uh, take a, a, make an, a new uh, approach of the problem that is taking in account people that are not inside the system. We have a question here in the front, but Sarah first, yes. Sarah, would you like to comment? Uh, yeah, um, actually, as I uh, tried to reflect it in my presentation as well, I already conceive um, economic growth as a hegemonic discourse uh, that expresses the processes of capital accumulation in a world historical context that I'm looking at. So, um, and I agree with the, all the comments um, in terms of how it became such a hegemony and how it, it dominates our mind and thinking. But we need to produce then alternative ways of uh, thinking and expressing these processes in a more uh, a politically specific way, I think. Thanks. Sari. Hello, Sari Hanafi from American University of Beirut. Uh, well, I did um, a kind of a discourse analysis of uh, 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 um, uh, International Association Congresses. You have Congress every four years. So uh, in the 90s, uh, with the word degrowth, uh, it was really targeting, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a political economy, uh, it's sociology of political economy. It means that top-down thinking how to change uh, uh, things. Uh, but, uh, but later on, uh, specifically in, uh, um, in the last uh, 10 years, uh, more and more uh, uh, there is a community who do a small community degrowth. I mean, this, uh, uh, and, and I notice uh, so many keynotes uh, in plenaries about this. So it's, it's more uh, bottom up. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, and, and um, uh, it's very interesting, uh, two months ago, uh, um, the Minister of Interior, French Minister of Interior, uh, he was asked what is the major threat today for France, he, he said the ecological groups. So more and more there is uh, a social movement uh, trying to dis uh, disrupt. Uh, uh, again, it's a bottom up. So, so what is uh, your comment about this top down, the failure of top down and the emergence of bottom up? And whether we, we nevertheless, we, we need to combine between them. So this is uh, the right. Thank you. So I guess everyone can comment on this, I would assume. I can say something. Jo Joan, would you like to start? I'm not supposed to, but, but I think that looking at these French debates, uh, quite recently, that uh, two or three years ago, I am in the list of distribution of something called in France, Les Soulèvements de la Terre, which is a group of people who were, in fact, the government tried to bring them to, to dismantle them, to forbid their existence and the Conseil d'État allowed them, at least for the time being, to exist. And they are called the uh, raising of the earth, which is a kind of metaphor. And they attack some issues, and when uh, they deal with some issues in the countryside, for instance, all this irrigation bassin, you know, some, which uh, they are against it, although the farmers perhaps are in favor of it, and so on. And, and one of the things that they have been, it was very easy to, if you, you can look at it through Reporter, which is a kind of French uh, newsletter on the environment, or looking at this, Les Soulevements de la Terre. The last thing they are very proud of, they, they stopped the company, Lafarge company, 
a cement company which is now linked to Holcim from Switzerland and which is everywhere, perhaps in Lebanon also, I think, if I remember. Because in France they had to stop La Farce from doing what they call betonage, more beton, more cement everywhere. So their, comp their campaign is called against beton, beton, pas beton. Uh, uh, yeah. and so they're very proud because they managed to stop one of the Lafarge uh, investments recently. Very recently means one week ago. And this is what you are talking about. This is what I call the growth in practice because it doesn't matter very much well, it matters, of course, whether they have read George Scalis, which is not unlikely, or, or Cesc Latouche, more likely, or whether they identify themselves as a post-growth or the growth movement. What is important, I think, well, it's also very important what they do. And in practice, they are moving, helping to move to a less unsustainable economy. And this happens if, even in places around the world where people don't know about the worst degrowth or post-growth, or when, where they would even resent these wars. Because very poor people around the world, they don't want to talk about degrowth, in my view. They don't want to talk because they think, first, it's a foreign name, it's a foreign issue, for instance, in Latin America. Many places were not very, very popular to talk about degrowth. But this idea, which comes from Georgia, actually, of or from one of his books, the growth in practice can mean two things. A small groups here in Barcelona living as the growers in their own way of living and so on, but also this large movement around the world, which we collect in the address of environmental injustice, but we cannot collect everything, of course, which is this practical movement, stopping pipelines, stopping quite often coal power for our plants, stopping coal mines, but not because of any different ideas, because of very practical circumstances. Well, this is my own view about the growth in practice. We have not arranged a question and answer, but, but, but it's just what it worries me, is this the growth in practice. Uh, okay, uh, actually I, in my presentation, I tried to give a perspective of anti-systemic movements and uh, actually during the 19th and 20th centuries, especially until the 1980s and until the rise of neoliberalism, that the working class movement, the labor movement were seen as the most progressive and uh, agents, of the so agents of social change, anti-systemic movements um, that are opposing capitalist system, right? Uh, but um, from 1980s onwards, something happened in the, in the, in the area of these collective actions. Uh, many people um, talked about the, the demise of labor movement, the, the demise of working class movement, right, in general, globally. Uh, and, um, and, so, uh, and many new social movements were regarded as um, the movements of identities, not, not against and the materiality of capitalism in that sense, in, compar in, in a comparable manner to the, the labor movements, right? But now uh, I think the political ecology movements uh, started to show that anti-capitalist um, position or anti-systemic uh, anti movements can be or indeed are uh, uh, coming over uh, from, from this um, field of political ecology who are experiencing um, important measures and social and socio-ecological transformations in their lives uh, as a result of the global, global ex, uh, expansion of extractivism, which now um, appears uh, also in the form of green extractivism, in the form of agrarian extractivism in, in new form, so it deepens uh, uh, through, uh, with, the, with the generalization of the commodity form, general commodification of our, every, uh, our whole life world, right? And so the, these movements, for instance, peasants in, uh, living in the uh, extractive frontiers were not rego regarded in the past as progressive agents of change, but now they claim something new, they uh, take an anti-capitalist position and express this very clearly, as in the case of Turkey as well as I know, uh, against extractive uh, uh, expansion, for instance, against extractive projects. Uh, so um, in that sense, it is normal <laughs> to have such a fear, and I think. Yeah, I, want to, I want to add an anecdote and then say something more serious. But uh, Joanne says that uh, 
He says, I, I, I wrote about the growth in practice and he really likes it, but I, I've told him again this, but I can share it. But the story is that I had the book, the draft, I sent it to John, and he's very generous with sharing his ideas. And then he told me what you miss is writing about the growth in practice, and then he sent me two paragraphs in the email, and then I just copy-pasted the email <laughs> <laughs> and edited it in the book. And then John read it, and he told me this was the best part of the book. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like he keeps forgetting that it's his part, you know. Anyways, I, li I like that he attributes it to me, but it was his. We're very good at self pleasure <laughs> Uh, no, to a, a more, a more like a, an answer to the point. I think a concept that we have developed in Barcelona, and actually Marta Conde, who is sitting behind you, is a concept of activism-led science, which is also something John had thrown in one of his books, and then Marta developed in his, her PhD. And, and the idea is there that uh, you know this top-down, bottom-up that you talked about. So I know that the growth might have appeared as a top-down discourse that came from academia, but if if, if you look into the history of the concept, which out of coincidence is also in France that you mentioned as an example. Uh, it were already, it was people, uh, activists on the ground that they had read a few books of Georgescu Rogan, someone else where they found, uh, Andre Gord, that they had used the word degrowth. And then they started using it on the ground, activists, to make sense of what they were doing. And then Serge Latouz, who knows how, got uh, to know these activists to be in the same meetings. Then he gave it another academic dimension. And now you say, a new reiteration of that is, again, activists. So it's a much more co-evolutionary process. And I think uh, also the examples from Latin America are that, now that the movements are creating new terms and new concepts on the ground, and then academics are coming and reflecting. Then other movements somewhere else read these academics and they are inspired. So I wouldn't say that it was a bottom-up that became a top, uh, a top-down that became bottom-up. I would say from the beginning, it's a much more mixed, uh, development of science by activists also. Mm. Marco, Gabriele, would, would you like to comment? Yes, I think this reflection needs to be nourished by the historical comprehension. It's for that I'm very pleased to be with historians here. No? <laughs> because, for instance, in Latin America, the discussion is uh, how, as Joan say, is not degrow. We speak about buen vivir, vivir bien. That it has the names in the local language, in the indigenous, and is in the constitution, Bolivia constitution, Ecuador constitution, suma causai, suma camaña. But there are very, very complex processes to, to uh, concretize that. For instance, in, it's very present in the constitution of Ecuador. It was President Correa that put in, in the constitution. But then he said, we need more extractivists to go away from the extractivists. And he gave for the land all of the idea. But even though last year there was a plebiscite about leaving the oil in the soil in Jasuni, the, the thing I was speaking, and this is protected now. And they say they don't do in that, but it's a, it's a conflict, no? So I think we need to think about the conflict as something that is immanent. We are, this not, you cannot solve this about uh, managerial solutions. And it's the history that is speaking here. No? But I am sure that it will be, the next year will be very present, this type of conflict in all our society and in our life. And it's for that we need to learn about it. Because it has to be with our lives, our present. I maybe I, I agree, so I, I will try to be very brief. One thing that struck me uh, about your uh, your question was this idea of the enemy, no? Mm -hmm. they, they, and I, I was thinking, and in the end I thought it's good. Uh, in which sense? Because, you know, I, I think that the toxic narrative that is mainstream, very strong now, is what also Georgos mentioned, the win-win. So there is, you know, the greenwashing of everything, and, you know, sure, I remember once I was in a in a workshop and uh, there was this facilitator and uh, she explained to me that I was, I was not a good scholar because I was using the word but, while well, the key word is end. So, you know, you say, you know, the grow and growth, Ku Klux Klan and something else, you know, whatever, right? And I was trying to make a point, no, sometimes you don't use end, you just say, you know, I cannot say, you know, it's vulgar, but just, you know, 
in, you know, point to the door in some cases, or maybe you don't sit to the table. There is also a freedom. You know, there is also this idea of, you know, I think there is almost a totalitarian understanding of participation. You know, I start, I want to do a terrible project in the community, and I invite the community to participate in discussion. Well, maybe the best thing is not participate. I mean, I don't think that the participation is always what is needed. I am not saying that it's, I mean, it, it depends, right? This is what I'm trying. But anyway, so enemy, I think, makes some sense because it's saying that there is somebody who's actually tried to sabotage the, you know, the system. And I, I think it's a good point, probably. The other, the other thing I want to say is that, well, we, uh, we, we are talking about you know, activists and scholars. Maybe we need also to think about arts and you know, other kind of knowledge. What does it mean, for instance, to open up the door to different kind of knowledge? I am reading now a series of poems by workers in Italy. What does it mean to understand the condition of capitalist organization of labor through poetry? I think sometimes it's more powerful than you know, reading another kind of report. And I believe the arts have been very active. And in the end, I don't know, I mean, I probably, you know, as I agree with Georgos, it's, it's a bit circular. And it's the, also the line between activism and, you know, the scholar uh, identity can be a little bit blurry. Many of my students were activists and they decided to do a PhD. So what happened to them? They stopped to be activists because they entered in a PhD, I'm not sure. And I am still with that Angela Davis that in the end, you know, all this might be just a toxic narrative and we need to decolonize our mind. And this is the first field of liber liberation where we need to fight. We forgot that, you know, the struggle is out there, but it's also a little bit here because otherwise the struggle out there will not work. Are there any more questions from the audience? Yes, we have one in front here. So uh, please state your name and to whom the question is directed. Thank you. I'm, <clears throat> I'm Julian. I'm from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, I know everybody hates the guy with two questions, so, but I have two. I'm going to try to make them quick. The first one for either Juan or Georgios. Um, how do you address the critics, critics of degrowth that say, I tend to agree with degrowth, but that technology will be inhibited and that'll affect our ability to fight climate change in that way, or environmental issues in that way? Then just a general question for everyone. It might be a question just to consider, but as a young person in the field, I already recognize how disconnected all parts of the environmental field are. And we all talk about how interdisciplinary it actually is. So what are actionable steps we can take, or I can take, to move into my career, to make sure that I'm not just focusing on environmental humanities or political ecology or a systematic way of approaching things, but also I'm able to look into environmental justice and figure out oil trade routes and how those have ish impacts and, in, and address politics. I think, yeah, that's just <coughs> Thank you. So, uh, Joan Georgis first. <coughs> first. I think that, that somebody saw, uh, you Marco saw this, uh, the environmental humanities and political ecology, and I, I noticed that political ecology, we work on conflicts within the present generation, I could say, and environmental history would be about the past, but also you said other species, okay? non-human species, which, uh, but neither of, of the two columns had the next generation, or the young generation, and even in the others, we noticed that we forgot at the beginning, 10 years ago when we started, to put children as protagonists of this kind of, more and more of this kind of uh, struggles around the world, and sometimes some local pollution, for instance, in China with uh, lead contamination in battery factories. I remember there are cases with the children as protagonists in the sense of being toxified but also going to the streets, and of course with climate change. And I think and what thing to be optimistic that has happened in the last few years is that you have young people going on strikes, school strike, or going on the streets. And in the others also we know that it's not just Greta Sorberg or Germans in Endegelende, no? Or other movements in Germany, young people, young women mostly, but also, for instance, in Bangalore, in India, there is a Disha Ravi, who is in the book, my book, there is a photograph of her showing, she wanted it to be, we asked her, showing with a sort of cardboard saying, 
give money to, to the farmers. This was when the farmers in Punjab were going in de to Delhi. Give money to the farmers and not to Adani and to the coal industry. For her pain, she was taken 14 days to Delhi by the police. And nothing happened to her very grave, but could have happened. And she was released, but it's very grave people, young people. And there are more people like this, and young women around the world. Because, well, this is uh, what the future requires. Yes. I don't know whether this was the question, or oh, yeah, answer to the question. I mean, the interdisciplinarity, I leave to others to answer. The technology one, um, I don't think at the growth position is that there's no, there's no room for new techniques in addressing environmental problems or human problems. So, for example, transitioning to clean energy sources is, I mean, one way or the other, it has to happen. There's no way of stopping emitting carbon unless we transition. Uh, the growth argument is a critique to the idea that this can happen uh, within the context of an ever-expanding economy. That's, that's the main critique. And the critique to technology there is, I would say, is again a critique to a narrative about technology that doesn't correspond to a material reality. And it is the narrative that one would find predominantly within mainstream economic accounts of growth, where growth is thanks to so-called technology alone, you know, and I think what, what I try to show is that technology in the sense of productivity, of doing things better, of doing more with less, it's one part of the story, but the very other big part of the story uh, is exploitation, is cost shifting, is uh, unpaid uh, labor, human and non-human labor. So if we understand that, um, there is a, a critique not to technology as such, but to the to the toxic narrative, so now we can talk in one another's language, to the toxic narrative that technology alone can be the solution and can keep the machine going forever without any problem. So it's the critique to the narrative about technology, not to technology. It's not a critique to solar energy as such, no? So would you like to respond to, to this uh, second? Yes. I would like to try. I think it's the right, <laughs> the right wording here. Well, first of all, uh, maybe I can say something about multidisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity, and so on and so forth. Um, well, you know, we are among friends, right? So let's try to be honest. The situation is not easy. I mean, everyone is talking about to be multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, and so on and so forth. But in the end, when you apply for a job, for instance, in academia, I see somebody <laughs> nodding. When you apply for a job in academia, no way there will be somebody at the door deciding you know, the percentage of the specific discipline to which you belong. And it can be very harsh. So what can we do? Well, what we can we do? I am the kind of guy who would say, let's take the Winter Palace. We are here to say that we want to change academia. And the first place is to try to change uh, the spaces in which we are. Of course, sometimes you need also to be bold. And this is why, for instance, in the institute that I was leading in, in Stock Stockholm for a while, we said that we were not multidisciplinary, we were not interdisciplinary, we were undisciplined. <laughs> because, you know, in the end, if you put together bad, uh, bad ingredients, it's not that, that since you put everything together, it would, would work well, right? It's still not so great. So start thinking about, you know, what is the patriarchal, species, racist, capitalist um, legacy of the disciplines in which we are. But this does not mean that you, you ignore the disciplines. If you want to change the canon, you need to know the canon very well. Otherwise, we are just naive. And it's fine, but it's a different thing. You know, the, the workers trying to sabotage a factory, they know very well how the factory works. They are not just there, OK, let's sabotage. <laughs> No, they, they must know the factory very well. But I want to say something about the other question very quickly, how to be engaged. I don't know, it's my, op my personal opinion, you know, absolutely. But I think that you should keep together to be angry about what is happening and the hope for something else. Because many times they say, you know, there are the bad activists, those who are angry, who protest, and then the good one who think about, you know, different. It's not true. It's the same person that sometimes the police 
is beating him up or her up, and some other times go to the farm at market and buy the food. It's the same person, just, you know, uh, not, not always beaten up, you know, it depends. So I think that we need, first of all, to keep together the two things, and you need to create your own community. Because you will not find the community there. There's no community. I don't believe in the, you know, in some com The community is born from the struggles. It's, it's part, it's, 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 it's a process of making of the identity. And so my hope for you, as it is for me, is to create and find my own community. Because alone, you can be, you know, everything, sure. But I don't think that, you know, the kind of engagement you are thinking can be an individual thing. You need to create a community. And the community will be born from and through the struggles. Sarah or Gabriela, would you like to come as well? Yeah. Uh, I can give my uh, own experience, actually, in terms of this inter interdisciplinarity, because I was educated in ec economics uh, during my undergrad years, and then I went to um, a sociology PhD in the, U in the United States because I was really interested in sociology of capitalist development and especially capitalist integration of Middle East region and at a, at a um, historical context in which there was a U US involvement in Iraq, uh, I decided to study um, processes of nation state formation in the Middle East and also the capitalist integration of the Middle East, especially through oil. Um, uh, but uh, so that, that was my purpose. So I was not trained in environmental studies at all. But when I studied, um, uh, started to study and research on the historical processes of um, transformation and capitalist development in the region, then uh, I realized that it is a necessity to focus on nature as well and how the socio-ecological interactions were transformed. So it was a historical necessity. And so depending on the context, depending on the theme, depending on the obje object of analysis, um, it generally emerged as, an, as, a, as a necessity, so I, uh, and um, uh, in uh, Marxist studies, for instance, in world system studies, there was no much focus on nature, and then I integrated with my uh, stud uh, studies with political ecology, ecological economics, environmental history, so in that way it developed. Yeah. Gabriela. Um, thank you for the question. Um, I came from a university that is public. I didn't have to pay to go to university, even for the PhD formation. And it is something that in Argentina, but also Colombia, Mexico, is very, very valuable. For, it was. It is in process to change. But it was very valuable for 15 years of, for my parents, for me, for different generations, if we are speaking about generation. That means that we value the university as a space of formation, but also a space of critique to go into politics, to debate things that are for society. And we are very, in, in middle class especially, and working class notably, the idea that we owe something to the society because we went to the school. So I think we need to, to put this in the center again, to, to have a, very, a, very, a more a complex idea of what I we doing when I go into university and taking. <coughs> and also, we, we, I think that there was a very turning point with pandemic crisis and people will be depressed. We need to speak about that. And we need a new university for these new times. And the university is a place that is very, very ancient in terms of how we think about knowledge. About interdisciplinarity, yes, I think we have problems with this. We offer, uh, we have package that we offer uh, environmental science, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, we we can't replace the disciplines like history, economy, sociology, etc. Because this is the, the mind field of the science, and, and science, and especially social science, need of this di discipline for the critic. For me, the, the process of knowledge is a process of critic. And finally, I can't say so much about technology, only to say that we need to avoid two, two sides of the problem. One is the fatalisms to say we can't do nothing because all of it is very terrible, we have no future. Both, all in this panel are not in this position. But the other position is do nothing because technology will solve. And this is a very, very strong problem for the perspective of political ecology. 
So this has been a very rewarding uh, discussion. We could have sat here for hours, but sadly we cannot. But I would like to give every panelist an opportunity to give a closing remark. And I would like you, I will not insist, you can say something else, but I would like you to point out in one minute or so where is global political ecology in 10 years and what has it accomplished? So, starting with you, Georges. 10 years from now? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Ideally, I mean, what is your vision of no, what, the other, what... The other you are, the, 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 the faster 10 years pass, so it doesn't seem too far away. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like tomorrow, because I'm already 14, no, we have 16 years here, so this is, uh, this is how fast time passes. Um, ten, ten, years, 10 years from here, I think it, 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 it would be a framework that uh, I hope can explain, uh, and this is what I try to say, how global political e ecology explains phenomena that we tend to put into the bracket of economics, uh, of the discipline of economics. So I think global political ecology would have proven itself as a strong framework of explaining phenomena that right now are thought of as uh, the special domain of other disciplines. And in doing so, would have also fertilized uh, the movement of movements uh, that is necessary for changing this world for the better, or at least making the unfolding disasters a little bit more uh, tolerable. Excellent. Sarah? Uh, actually, um, I think uh, that we are in the midst of or beginnings of a complete global socio-ecological rift. Um, we are seeing a planetary process of uh, um, urbanization of nature in the sense that transformation of nature into an extractive frontier through different forms of extractive projects in, in energy uh, sector, in, in, uh, in agrarian production, in, in terms of green extractivism. So. Um, and we can also we also see, especially in urban sociology, in urban studies, the, the rise of theme of planetary urbanization as well, right? And it, that triggers each other uh, in a way. Um, uh, so the, 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 the disposes people uh, who are displaced from their rural environments, for instance, in, in eventually ends up as ecological refugees or migrants uh, to, to compose the uh, precariat classes in the, in the urban spaces, right? Um, so the, the, this increasing socio-ecological rift through planetary um, urbanization of nature and planetary urbanization of human population uh, poses a, a big um, important challenge for us. And in, in um, tackling with this challenge, I think uh, political ecology matters, social environmental movements um, matters uh, increasingly, and global political ecology will deal with, I think in the last 10 years, this planetary um, uh, transformation uh, more deeply. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sarah. Marco. Yes, uh, 10 years from now. Very good. So I think let's dream. Sure. Let's dream. I think this is the exercise. I think that political ecology will be taught in every university around the world. It will have a strong eco-feminist component and uh, it will uh, inform public policies. It will be fundamental uh, in all the progressive parties around the world and it will, it will finally reconcile something that I do believe it's very crucial, which is the worker struggles and the environmental struggle, clarifying that the enemy is not those who work in the factories, but those who are owning the factories and making them sick. Thank you very much. Uh, Gabriela. Okay, if we will survive the, the wars and the libertarian projects, uh, we have a very, and, and we will survive, of course, I have my answer. Uh, we have a big project to do. We need more, more people to do this project because it's a, it's a wide project. First, because as uh, Marco Armiro said, and I wrote in a book, that is all, pol all ecology is politics. So it becomes very important, the discussion about ecology in all of the aspects of the life. And we see that there, there is a concept in sociology with a, a ambientalization of, of, of different aspects of life. 
so it will be important in these terms, in a public debate, I think, if we have the opportunity to have, if we are free to have this public debate, we, it will go in this direction. Uh, second, for me, ecolo political ecology is about life. It's about the different meanings of life and defending the life. Not uh, looking at the life as an orga organic process. It's also a relation process and vitalic process. And even connected to the non-human or other than human. And even with the objects, no? we need to re resignify all of this aspect. And finally, we need new cosmopolitics, new ways of thinking about land, about life, about with relationship with other than humans. And this requires, of course, uh, ecofeminists, a uh, new view about knowledge, not only scientific or academic knowledge. We need the other knowledge. There are different uh, forms of knowledge all over the world. And also we need a decolonizing the academic because we, don't, we can see only the process of the problem from only one point of view, from one center. Thank you. Juan, well, do you have I any? I agree with what they said. And I think that in the nearest time, which is uh, perhaps I will reincarnate, I have not planned exactly how I'm going <laughs> to be, be alive. Ten years. <laughs> then um, I think that political ecology should be really global, and I'm very grateful to the Holberg Committee, Price Committee, for accepting this title for this. But we have not been really global because there is nobody from China, nobody from India, nobody from Africa because the table is not long <laughs> enough, perhaps, and we know the reasons. And I think that these great people writing from these continents, or acting, acting and writing, or making films, or whatever they do, from all these places, for instance, perhaps in China, in 10 years' time, there will be a branch of the Communist Party, which is very likely to be there still for another 100 years, but will be perhaps eco-Marxist, isn't it? We have already written, um, even here in the table, there's been a lot of eco-Marxist discussion. One can be optimistic on that side. Will be will become a global kind of I don't care whether it's a discipline, or we don't really care whether it's a discipline or not. The field of study, mm -hmm. ecological economics, political ecology, artivism also, iconography of all these things, and films. I am too late to become a filmmaker, but <laughs> I would have liked to do it. And, and also, I think that what we're doing also now, which is important, is to study business from the environmental point of view. For instance, the BP case is a case of business, ecology, environmental history, and political history, and national history in a very hot place as it is West Asia. And we are publishing today or tomorrow, this week, an article on the Total Energy Company in France, sort of trying to study the conflicts around the world and this, I hope, in 10 years' time, could be taught in business schools. Something that Holbert didn't do, business, and we don't do either, very much here, yeah, business studies. But of course, we know how many students are in business studies. So we could have critical, environmental, ecological, economics, political ecology, business studies. Some of them might go into this kind of, of work. And even if they want to make money, probably, but I mean, that this can be done, I think. And we have noticed this a bit late with the others, that we know a lot about companies around the world, and we can start writing articles on these companies. And we have already three or four articles published on this. So business, ecological, economics. I don't know whether the Holberg Prize could do it. Perhaps under theology or kind of <laughs> modern, modern, modern theology. Very modern theology. Liberation theology. For well, sure it's religion. <laughs> Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy, actually, that we end on a sort of a bit upbeat note here. When you talk about global political ecology and uh, the world we live in and the world or worlds that might uh, come. And I think you've all given us lots of food for thought um, and uh, given us impetus to go out and address these issues. So thank you very much. Thank you also to Institute. 
the Studis Catalans for hosting us, to Holberg Prize Laureate Professor Joan Martinez Allier for taking the initiative to this event. Uh, thank you to all the panelists. And last but not least, thank you to the audience who have shown up on this day and engaged these questions. Thank you also to those who have watched from home. And now, give us all a round of applause.